On that temperature note, I uh, want to welcome Ulrike Richardson, who uh, has briefed us uh, virtually. Who's here. We're delighted to have her in person, who is the resident coordinator and humanitarian coordinator in Haiti, uh, where lots has been happening. So we're happy to have you here to give us an update. Ulrike, please. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Steph. No, I need to. It'll, it'll, hold on. There we go. Perfect. Okay, do it. it was on already. Yeah, the engineer will do it. Do All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so thank you very much Steph, for, for having me today. And uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to, to be able to see you in person and address you in person as opposed to the virtual uh, um, interactions that we've had over the past uh, weeks and months. In fact, uh, I'm here in New York for three days to meet with U UN colleagues and, and senior leadership and, and other partners to, to discuss the situation in Haiti. Uh, and um, I just could give you a bit of an update since we last uh, had a contact, which was on the 16th of November. So uh, as you may have uh, followed, the, the cholera outbreak continues to, to uh, be a worry for the country and for us. Um, it, uh, cases continue to, to raise and rise, and you have now uh, 283 people that have died from, from the illness, and we also have close to 12,000 people that have been hospitalized during this period. So this is since 2nd October. Uh, and we have also close to um, more than 13, 14,000 now uh, suspected cases of cholera uh, throughout the country. And what we are seeing, in fact, is not only the continued increase of cholera cases, but also the spread to the regions, and there is now uh, in, in eight of the ten departments, there are confirmed cholera cases, and this is a worrying trend for us and for the country. Uh, and we continue to, to provide a response in various ways as the United Nations, as agencies, uh, together with our partners, local partners, international partners, and obviously um, quite an important leadership from the, the Ministry of Health and, and, and uh, oh, Ministry of Public Health. So when I was here last time, or spoke we, when we spoke on the 16th of November, we had just launched uh, the appeal, uh, the, uh, the flash appeal to, for the humanitarian response, which includes obviously the co uh, uh, cholera, but also the response to the, the increased uh, numbers of hunger. We see one in every second Haitian uh, being food insecure, and for the first time, these cas catastrophic conditions of, of hunger present in Haiti for the first time. 20,000 people. But so we launched the flash appeal, um, about $145 million. Uh, we have right now uh, received 23.5 million. I'm really grateful for those donors who've, who've responded positively, but uh, it's only 16% of, of the total amount. Uh, in fact, the, the humanitarian needs continue to, to increase. We have uh, we have, in fact, uh, as opposed to last year, we, have, we are now preparing the humanitarian response plan for next year. And in fact, the, the value of that plan is, um, is $719 million. So that is a double as of this year. That means it's an indication of the humanitarian needs in Haiti. Um, so it, it, it is a worrying situation. Uh, you will remember that when we spoke last time, the, this, this Vareux terminal, the, main, uh, the country's main uh, fuel terminal, had been opened, freed by the Haitian police. And so we have now fuel in the capital, not so much in the departments. Uh, but the insecurity continues to be rampant and uh, with really chilling reports of uh, human rights violations and with really really um, worrying levels of, of violence in general. So the, and, and, and that is happening in a situation where, where the country is facing social political instability, as you know. And, um, and so this uh, insecurity and the gang uh, domination in the capital is now close to 60% of the entire capital. And, um, and they use, they, they still use and with very terrifying levels of intensity, um, sexual violence as a, as a weapon to, to keep populations, um, let's say, under control, uh, instill fear, uh, and to punish populations. Um, and uh, it affects women, girls, but also men, men and boys, because the gangs, they fight over territory. And so this is, that territory is worth both fighting for and defending 
at all costs, and the cost here is a human cost, and it's enormous for people what they face on an everyday um, basis. So, um, so this the, the the gang violence, but including in particular the sexual violence, really is worrying because because of the victims, because it's violence in itself and the violations of of people's human rights and also any type of freedom freedom of movement and, and living without fear. But it's also really tearing the, the, the society apart. It's already a society that is marked by the violence. And so this territorial fight between gangs is also sort of dividing populations. And that means that it's going to be very difficult if we don't address this now, uh, because uh, the society that we will then have in a few months once hopefully the violence have seceded, uh, then I think it's going to be very difficult in terms of social cohesion and reconciliation. So that's something that we need to work on. So, um, so insecurity continues a uh, uh, real uh, worry. Um, also, the, the insecurity has, has led to um, a, a massive d displacement, internal displacement in, in Port-au-Prince in particular. We have 155,000 internally displaced. And this is a 77% increase since August this year. And these people, the most vulnerable, again, a lot of families, a lot of women with lots of children, they are in temporary sites, but also hosted in, in, in communities. So you have a lot of host families. And, and this is something that we are currently working uh, with institutions to see how we can address, because it, it's great to see that warm solidarity that people in Haiti have with each other uh, and it's you know and that's I think we need to recall that but it's also it, it's still people who share very meager resources and so this can't continue for a very long time so yeah so maybe just to say uh, on a on a positive note um, the schools are being reopened um, it's really challenging and there are four million children that are affected by by the schools and many of these children have not followed, uh, let's say, proper school, um, any type of education since the beginning of COVID. So you can imagine the impact on children in this situation. Now the schools are opened. They have reopened uh, at a level of 53% throughout the country. And most schools have actually opened in the south. So there is a, a huge disparity also within the country. But the impact on children of this crisis is enormous. Um, so yes, so just one final word maybe to say that as the UN we continue to support. We support the cholera response. We support the Edu Ministry of Education in the opening of schools. We obviously do uh, food distribution and non-food items. We have a logistical challenge, as you can imagine, and a security challenge. But we are able to, to be present, and we are able to help people. Um, and what we're also trying to do while we, we're help, helping people in the immediate uh, crisis, people to basically strengthen their coping mechanisms and saving lives, uh, we are obviously focus, focusing on the most vulnerable, but we also try not to lose focus on, on the real structural root causes. So we have corruption, we have impunity, we have governance, and, and all of that needs to really be at the center also of our thinking as we go forward. And we need to see how we can really move with the nexus as we make a response in this immediate term. So see how we can really feed you know, humanitarian together with that development perspective uh, and really the, the social cohesion and the reconciliation that I was talking for. So with that, again, thank you very much for, for the attention. You play a huge role. And I think it's very important to, to keep Haiti. You know, there, is, there is a lot of hot spots. And we heard it throughout the, the briefing. And I always follow the briefings that you do, um, and and it's not easy to keep countries on the agenda. And Haiti is a small um, country, and it's sort of far away from from some, closer to others. So, I think your role is very important. And thank you for having me. Oh, uh, Edie Letter, Associated Press. Uh, thank you very much on behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Association for doing this briefing. Um, a couple of questions. Um, the Haitian government has asked the international community for security assistance. Um, there's been a lot of uh, difficulty trying to get this assistance going. How 
important is it? And in your discussion with uh, UN police officials here today, uh, this past few days, um, have you heard about any progress? And a second completely different um, question on hunger. Um, is what percentage of the um, Haitian population is considered in, uh, you know, serious threat, and what are they up to on the fuse index, which is the famine index, you know, levels one, two, three, four, five? Thank you. Thank you very much. Please. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, so on the on the um let me just yeah. So on, on this on the international force, yes, that there was a request from the from the current prime minister to to the secretary general for the help uh, of the international community to address the humanitarian situation, the insecurity, but also at the time the, the blockade of the fuel terminal. Um since then there has been intense conversations. There are there are members of the Security Council have discussed this. Uh, they are still discussing, they are in particular focusing on potential leadership, potential composition of such a force. Um, and um, so far it's, it's, it's still with the Security Council members um, and, um, and the discussions are still ongoing uh, and we will see where this leads us. What is very important here is that the gang violence needs to be addressed uh, for people, for a normal Haitian, and the more vulnerable you are, the more poor you are, the more terrible is the situation. But everyone is affected by the violence, and, and it just puts the country really on a, on a downhill sort of um, journey. And so that needs to be addressed, and so what the UN is doing in the meantime, while we wait for a decision to be taken by the Security Council members, is, uh, is to support the national police, and that we're doing together with a lot of bilateral partners as well. So the national police needs to be at the forefront of any type of response, obviously, and they need to be, they need a lot of support in terms of equipment and training. On the hunger, so I would say that there is probably 49, 48, 49% people in, 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 in basically in, in need of uh, food assistance, uh, urgent food assistance, so that's half of the population. Uh, you have the IPC5 is present in Haiti, and those are the 20,000 uh, people that live under catastrophic famine-like conditions. So this is the IPC5. Uh, so it's the catastrophic conditions, that's how that's being defined. And most of these people are in the capital in Cité Soleil, 19,000. The other part is in the south. Thank you. Efrain? Thank you very much. <coughs> Thanks very much. Uh, I have two questions. Um, the first one on the 16% of the humanitarian response being um, uh, funded so far, what is the justification of donors for this um, uh, inappropriate response to the situation in a time and age where literally trillions of dollars are floating around the world every day? How do, we, how do they justify and explain that uh, the meager sum of 145 million is not um, you know, in comparison with the trillions. That's my first question. And on the sexual violence against women, when a woman is attacked sexually, what are the resources that are available for her there? <clears throat> Where can she go? Who talks to her? What happens when she comes and talks mm -hmm. to you? So, uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so the flash appeal, um, the 16 percent, yes, we hope that this is, it's, we hope that that's just the beginning. So, we keep hope up that other donors will step forward. Uh, the truth is that, that there is, I mean, I think we heard it from the emergency response coordinator, Martin Griffiths, uh, some time ago, that there is a serious underfunding of the humanitarian needs in the world because also the humanitarian needs are increasing. So I think that there is generally, um, yeah, probably less, less um, more crisis, and, and so hence um, funding needs to be distributed. Um, in, in Haiti, uh, unfortunately, traditionally, uh, the humanitarian response has been underfunded. It's been traditional, like 30%. We actually saw an increase this year of 40% of our humanitarian response plan. Uh, so this is slightly different from the flash appeal. Uh, but uh, yeah, 
I think it's a matter of, again, more information needs to be out there about Haiti. Um, I am from, from Sweden, and I know that there's not much information and knowledge about Haiti in Europe, for example. So I think it's also a matter of getting the word out there that there is a humanitarian crisis happening here, and it's urgent. Uh, your, the sexual violence, um, so it is difficult. You can imagine these in, in Cité Soleil, for example, the police is not present. There is no justice system. Uh, you have no institutions. So we had, during July, there was uh, reports, uh, and we had testimonies of 50, 52 women having been raped, most of them gang raped, uh, and many of them in front of their children. Uh, so we were able to um, support, I think f all, of, all of them were asked what they wanted in terms of support. And I think a few of them basically didn't want because they were fear of retaliation, shame, the, the sort of, unfortunately, the very sort of usual feelings that, that women have after, after rape. Um, but um, but uh, the others, they get health care. So, you know, you need to see a medical doctor, some type of medical institution. And then we work with, for example, Médecins Sans Frontières or other institutions to get... The, uh, GSKO is a local organization, for example, that specializes also with uh, uh, sort of victims. And then it's psychosocial um, support. And also uh, they can get access to free legal aid. What, what is challenging is, 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 is the, the, the economic support that they, you know, if, because they would need to be re, re, let's say, if they offered a job somewhere or, or be relocated. But we were able to support many of these victims. Much more is needed, and obviously much more is needed to stop the sexual violence. But uh, we really tr try to be um, very victim-focused when it comes to, to these victims. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to China Central TV, and then we'll go online to Jacqueline. Hi, Ms. Richardson, Dr. Xu with China Central Television. I have several questions, but I think you can answer them briefly. First one, uh, we know that last month, I believe, the Security Council has already passed the resolution to sanction the gangs in Haiti. According to your observation, has this worked or not? And secondly, uh, when when the SG called for an international intervention to stabilize the situation in Haiti, that was in October. And how do you think th this is still the case that uh, Haiti need international intervention? And what is the sentiment for Haitian people, not the government, Haitian people, on um, another uh, international intervention? And the last question, it might be a little bit too far, but if, I, if you, you answer it, I would be very happy. Uh, because we know that it, it, there, were several, there were several different interventions of the international security forces in Haiti in the past several decades. Um, how, can, how, can you, how can the UN ensure this time it worked to, to stabilize the situation there? Thank you. So on the sanctions, um, so the sanctions resolution was passed, yes, uh, and that was to establish a UN sanctions regime. The UN sanctions re regime is now being established, so m we expect that that will be up and running in January. The committee is established and the, the panel of experts, there are four experts, so they are being put together right now as we speak. So that we hope is, is then will start uh, its work in, in, as of January. Uh, in the meantime, there has been bilateral san sanctions, uh, from, particularly from the U.S. and from Canada, and I'm sure many of you have followed that. So it's difficult to say now if it has worked or not. So the U.N. sanctions regime hasn't started yet. What we are seeing is that it, it is, it's, not, it's not happening without attention in Haiti. P people, th there is attention to this. Uh, what is very important um, for sanctions, um, you know, in my view, is that it's followed with some judicial process also in Haiti, right? So I think that's something that probably um, we could, you know, we could think of in, in the, you know, to, to see how, how to support that. But right now, um, we look forward to, to the start of the work of the UN sanctions uh, regime. Um, on the... On the, on the international intervention, I think I already responded to, to that question, but maybe what the Haitian people are thinking, th well, obviously, uh, difficult to speak on behalf of a whole population, uh, so I don't pretend to do that, but a lot of the sentiment is that 
while there may be hesitation, you know, of the fact that you, 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 that you can't handle this as Haiti alone, I think that is a normal feeling of any citizen. Uh, but there is also sentiment that, you know, this violence can't continue and we have to address and we have to stop the violence. Um, and, um, and, and now with the UN's connection with this uh, international uh, force, you know, if, can we stabilize the force that is happening now is if it will happen and whatever will come is not a UN force, right? So that will be a different, it's a bilateral, a group of bilaterals who will, I think what we, what we realize is that, and I, I mentioned it, is to not keep, not lose track of the long term, the structural root causes, because what we are seeing are symptoms of deep-rooted impunity, corruption, a justice system that doesn't work, a governance, you know, it has to, has to strengthen. We see weakened uh, public institutions in, in terms of being able to invest properly in health care, in education, in social protection. And then, of course, a fragility vis-a-vis -vis, uh, natural disasters, you know, uh, all types. So, and, and particularly, I would say, the first, you know, corruption, impunity, and the governance. I think it is so important that we don't lose track of that. And I think without, with that, I think the likelihood of stability will increase. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go online to Jacqueline Charles, uh, Miami Herald. Jacqueline? Hold on, you're still muted. Hold on. Go ahead, try. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Go ahead. Hi, thanks for doing this. Good afternoon. Um, you mentioned the conversations are ongoing, but it seems that since the Mao Peel terminal has been unblocked, that the international community has lost a sense of urgency. We're not seeing any takers. And yet today you've also painted a very grim picture of the reality on the ground. Practically every week we are seeing reports of a massacre, a gang massacre that's happening in, in, in some community and increasingly outside of Port-au-Prince. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, how long can the Haitian people wait and what keeps you up at night? What, what is your concern about where this can all um, lead to, how bad it can get? <laughs> yes, um, I, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I, as I mentioned before, that there is the the request for for that force was done in 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 the name of of you know really humanitarian and and helping the country get over this humanitarian crisis so w the discussions that happens in the security council i i can't you know i can't anticipate or speculate on 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 where they will take us but and how bad the situation can go, and I think this is the big question uh, because people are suffering, and 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 the violence that people in the capital are being, uh, let's say, um, confronted with on a daily basis, is is rather impossible. It's it's not. It's, it can't continue. So I think um, I think that there is a sense of urgency, and there are a lot lot of actors here that share the sense of urgency, but it's also tricky, right? So I think we, we all realize that. Uh, one of the, um, I think what keeps me up at, at night and, and awake at night is, is, is obviously the suffering that people around me are, are, are facing, the, the suffering that people are facing on a daily and hourly basis. Um, I think that's, that's horrendous. And, and what can we do right now and also in the medium term to, to to, to uh, let's say, to help people. I think that that's what I'm worried about. Thank you. Um, Stefano, and then we'll go to... Chris. Thank you, Stefano Vaccaro, I watch New York. I have to follow up on uh, what I was asking you again on the intervention. Um, because it's, it's been now months since the, couple of months since the Secretary General asked the Security Council, you saying that the Security Council is discussing maybe the matter, or anyway, taking its time. Um, I hope you can answer, but don't you, don't you think that UN as an institution and the Secretary General that can address the Security Council more than once should have 
uh, now for the next letter maybe, or the next L, uh, a sense of uh, more urgency and, uh, and uh, stress the fact that there is an entire city, an entire uh, Port-au-Prince in the hands of these uh, gangs. And so there is not any more <laughs> time to discuss. Is it just the time to take a decision? And I just have this is to you again, to you as a, uh, working for the United Nations. What if this was another place? Was it an entire city somewhere else was in the hand of gangs? I mean, it looks like it, people, you know, the world is forgetting Haiti. Well, I think that's, that's why your role is so important. You know, help the world not to forget Haiti. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it's, uh, I, I, I share, you. I can understand the frustration, uh, and, and I, I see the, the, the urgency. Uh, this is an issue for the Security Council to, to decide upon, and I think what we are doing as the UN is, is, is keep, uh, is keep uh, sharing information about Haiti, being present in Haiti, helping where we can in the immediate, but really making sure that, that we do, that we report on what's going on, and having this relationship also with the media and the press to make sure that information is out there about the urgency of the situation and about the really precarious and severe conditions that people are facing on a daily basis in Haiti. Ms. Salome Al Jazeera. Thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk about the challenges um, for the UN operating in this environment, and I don't know how many uh, UN staff are on the ground there at this stage. Um, but also, I'm wondering, given there have been so many past interventions internationally, um, bilaterally, and given the level of corruption that you yourself have acknowledged in the country, um, not to mention the ongoing gang control, what kind of assurances do you have to give donor countries that the money is actually getting to, to where it needs to go? So, um, your first question was on the on what what obstacles? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So we have we have we have most of our staff is still in in Haiti, right? And in fact, a lot of our staff are Haitians who work really tirelessly uh, to respond, and and we also have many internationals. So um, a lot of we have security concerns. So obviously. Many of the humanitarian workers, we know that humanitarian workers should have access, free access, and not fear, fear, you know, need to have fear for their lives to when they carry out uh, humanitarian assistance. We are able to carry out humanitarian assistance. We see that it goes to people in need. We, I see cholera patients being treated. I see people who are hungry, hungry who get food. I see children coming back to school. Uh, I see, uh, for example, uh, how we can get clean water to some of the communities. So I see that there is, you know, when we, when we get support from donors, we know that we can deliver that support directly to the population in need. Uh, and so, um, and, and what, uh, so that's the only reassurance that we can give, obviously. Uh, and, and for our people, the security is a big concern. But we also have logistics concerns because the the south and the north are being also blocked by the gangs, the national roads to these to the south and the north, and that means that when we move our staff or, or supplies, we have offices in in all over the country, so we are, work from our offices in in the north and the south. But when we move supplies, that's an issue. So we use uh, often the the UNHAS, the humanitarian transport fleet, uh, that is generally generously supported by donors, to move people and, and goods around, but also um, barges, so like boats, uh, that can then move uh, bigger quantities of, of supplies. But logistics, it's, it's a big issue, yeah. So those are military trucks that are transporting them? The no, no military. We don't, there, there is no military. We, the UN, we have no military on the ground, uh, so there is no, let's say, peacekeeping mission in, in Haiti any longer. Uh, so we basically do this with our, our agencies and, and uh, with local partners. Thank you. Ulrike, thank you very much for thank taking you. the time. Uh, and please do come back in brief, either in person or virtually, whenever. You're most welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.